Matani and, and also uh, Tim McLaughlin. Now, Shabani is the international invest investigative journalist for the Washington Post. She had previously worked for the Wall Street Journal in um, uh, Myanmar and also in Chicago and in Singapore. Tim is the contributing writer for the Atlantic. He had previously worked for the Reuters based in uh, Myanmar and in Chicago, and they have both reported strongly on the protests in Hong Kong in, in 2019 and events in Hong Kong since. And the talk is based on these new books that they have published, which is a very interesting and insightful books on what happened to the uh, protests, protesters in Hong Kong. What I would propose we do is that I will ask them to make a very, very brief introduction um, on why they write the book and how the book is relevant to our understanding of Hong Kong today first. Then we will have a bit of conversations with me, asking them uh, a few questions, but I will be allowing for a lot of time for you to put your questions and for them to respond to you. Given that we are dealing with the subject of Hong Kong and the protests in Hong Kong since the introduction of the Hong Kong National Security Law, I want to very much underline that if you would like to raise a question without reviewing your identity, you are very welcome to do so. And to do that, please use the question and answer uh, command on the Zoom platform. If you could provide uh, some information about yourself, whether you want to put down your name or not, it's up to you, but some identifiable information for me to know where the question comes from. It will help me to pick the questions to put to the speakers. But if you say from the very beginning that you would like to stay anonymous, your wish will be respected and none of those information will be revealed uh, in this session. But all the questions and, uh, questions and comments being raised will be saved and they will be shared with the speakers so they will see them uh, after this meeting. Um, with that, let me now um, in, invite teams to begin with to talk about why they have written this book. Over to you, Tim. Yeah, great. Well, thank you very much. And um, yeah, thanks thanks for having us and for all the people that have, that have joined to listen um, and, and have bought the book or read it. Um, very much appreciate, um, you know, the support and the interest in Hong Kong. Um, yeah, so Shabani and I um, both moved to Hong Kong um, in 2018, um, I think both of us, when we got there, um, you know, Shivani had a new job at the Washington Post and I just started working for the Atlantic. Um, you know, a lot of the work and focus of what we were doing was outside of, of Hong Kong. You know, I think there's a belief that this city was kind of slow on the news front, um, that we would spend a lot of time traveling around, um, and, uh, visiting other countries to do a reporting, but that Hong Kong itself wouldn't be that kind of newsworthy. That obviously turned out to be totally, uh, an incorrect, um, sort of reading of, of the future there. Um, and so, you know, we were both there when the protest started and, uh, attempted to go to as many, you know, events, protests, marches that we could go to throughout the time there. Um, we both wrote a lot of stories for the Post, for the Atlantic, me for a few other kind of outlets along the way. Um, and I think that there was a feeling that, uh, there was still a lot to be said and a lot to be written about the protest and the people involved. And a big part of that was because obviously the pandemic started right as kind of the NSO, um, you know, was implemented and the world's attention really obviously shifted uh, to, the, to the pandemic, to COVID, to kind of figuring out what was going on in the world. Um, so it felt kind of unfinished to us, I think, um, in a way, um, you know, the ending was not uh, kind of wrapped up, uh, you know, neatly, it kind of just 
died off uh, in this kind of very strange, um, you know, once in a lifetime kind of way. Um, so I think that was kind of our impetus for for wanting to to do the book and to, you know, we had so much stuff that we still wanted to say and people we wanted to talk to. Um, so that was kind of really the driving factor behind it was to just get more of the story out. Um, and we chose four characters to do that. Um, and, you know, we used them to kind of talk about different parts of the protest movement, different, different uh, you know, bits of, of history of, of, of Hong Kong. Um, yeah, you know, I think um, just to to build a little bit on, on on what Tim said, you know, I think there was and and sort of linking it back to the present day and the and the contemporary, right? I mean, I think we had this sense that there was an urgency to sort of record down, you know, what really happened in those years, and in fact, what led up to the um, explosion of of protests in in 2019, because uh, you know we were already starting to see these signs of narrative control and, and rewriting of history. Uh, coming from both the Hong Kong and, and, and the mainland authorities, right? Uh, you know, e even when we first started um, sort of kind of conceptualizing the book and, and so on, you know, we had the sense that things were moving much more quickly than than, than anyone really anticipated. We had meetings sort of set up with um, a few of the people who eventually became, you know, kind of main characters or main people in our book. One of them was Gwyneth Ho. And within that week, um, that was when the arrests um, of that big group um, that became known as the NSL 47 um, that is now still uh, detained, um, well, many of them still detained and awaiting the result of their trial, um, you know, against, um, you know, the, the accusation is that they have, uh, you know, plotted to to subvert the authority of the state, right? Um, and, you know, suddenly, uh, all these people that we talk to so frequently, all these people that we interface with a lot were all, you know, locked away and, and their views were all, you know, that then going to be silenced for the next few years. Um, so really, I think, you know, the exercise of this was really playing catch up in many ways and, and trying to get down everything before it started getting erased, removed, um, before all the Apple Daily archives got taken offline, before, you know, Stan News shut down and Citizen News shut down. Um, and, you know, we really felt, you know, this sort of responsibility, right, as journalists to be able to to kind of capture what we saw, what we witnessed, um, you know, on the ground, right. Um, and, and again, just to bring it to, you know, what we're experiencing and seeing in Hong Kong today um, with the, the trials, um, particularly of, of Jimmy Lai, um, that's you know underway in the courts right now. We see this real kind of attempt to frame the protests as like something started by a single mastermind who was influenced or manipulated by the U.S. Potentially the U.K. Japan has been thrown into there as well. Um, and and Jimmy Lai is this kind of like single figure, right? Who, um, as the narrative goes, uh, influenced you know millions of people uh, either through Apple Daily or his money or whatever. Um, but, you know, people who have been watching this closely know that wasn't true, right? Um, and so in highlighting, you know, the motivations and, and, and sort of the histories and desires, I think, of, of, you know, the people that we've chosen in our book, right? We hope to show that really this was a sort of generational ground up thing with, you know, uh, its roots in history, decades long grievances, fundamentally around the idea that Hong Kong people have never been able to choose for themselves their own destiny, their own fate, their own leader. Um, and, and we we hope to have encompassed that those sort of themes and ideas in, in this book. Thank you. That's very, very helpful. Let me let me now start off by asking you. You have this absolutely fantastic title for the book called Among the Braves. It gives readers or potential readers a sense of the Braves being people of Hong Kong as a whole. And the Braves here also specifically referring to a particular subset of the protesters in the 2019 Hong Kong protests. The people who were taking more direct actions mm -hmm. rather than protesting in the more traditional Hong Kong way of very, very peaceful and orderly um, demonstrations, not mm -hmm. even quite to the extent of this civil disobedience that was being practiced by Gandhi was even more moderate than that, which was really quite an achievement. So who are the Braves that you're talking about? What bind them together? I do. Yeah, um, I think this is also a bit of a role reversal. We're usually the ones asking you questions um, <laughs> for our uh, for our own story. So uh, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right there. You know, we wanted to um, highlight kind of Hong Kong as a whole. And I think the bravery that we saw of many people, of all the people that came out 
or even didn't come out to the streets, people who are working kind of in the background in a kind of support way as well. You know, I think everybody, uh, especially towards the end of the protests, when the risks were much higher, not just for, you know, physical violence, but also for, you know, losing friendships with family or relationships or money, you know, there was a, a, a different risk factors for different people, right? So I think we wanted to encompass that. And then when you talk about the subset, I think, you know, we did want to highlight, um, at least with three of the characters, kind of the younger generation of protesters who we kind of identified, I guess, pretty strongly with the movement, you know, who kind of reflected the people that we had met, you know, day to day, um, weekend to weekend covering covering the movement. Um, so I think that was certainly part of it, though one of the characters obviously older to kind of guide you through the history of, of, of things. But I think, you know, there was a choice by us to kind of choose younger people, um, you know, I think we were also interested in their views on the mainland, on Hong Kong's relationship with the mainland, how that may be different from the older generation, the kind of Martin Lee's of, of uh, you know, the world. I think there's definitely, um, you know, some divisions over kind of how they view the mainland, how they view democracy on the mainland and how those efforts have progressed. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, that's you, you're kind of right there. We did choose those people. And then I don't know if Shabani has any bits that she wants to add to that, but yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the things that we were very very interested in, especially you know, with 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 the book, right? We had more space to kind of document and trace this, is how that that kind of subset of the Braves, as in the people who took the more radical and violent action, became radicalized, right? Yeah. Um, over the course of Hong Kong's history, as you say, you know, in 2014 during the Umbrella Movement, you know, it was it was unheard of or shocking to even have people, you know. Uh, break a window or something, right? And you, people were criticized for even showing that kind of level of quote unquote violence, which you know anybody familiar with protests in in the UK, for example, would know that's kind of kind of part of the cause, right? Uh, in 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 most like normal democratic societies that are used to protest. And so, how did we get from that, right? Where there was you know chiding or or dissatisfaction for even the most like light um sort of violent action to then uh, uh, all of society kind of actually tolerance and 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 support you know even for for quite um violent quote unquote violent or, or radical actions right like um, for example breaking into the legislative council um on July 1st 2019 and and so on and so Tommy who is who is the 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 one of the main characters in our book he's sort of a bit more of an everyman protester you know we we sort of chart that his journey you know from just being a kind of apolitical a sort of student, sort of like class clown, kind of a, a goofy sort of guy, to then picking up eggs and pelting it at the police uh, headquarters, to then learning how to make Molotov cocktails, and and later on, you know, sort of growing like deeper and deeper and deeper into these sort of like factions that were really backing a lot more sort of violent action against the police. And I think that that to us was was very interesting to try to figure out the psychology and the reasons behind that evolution. Actually, that really needs lead very neatly to what I wanted to uh, ask you next, which is about the four anchor individuals in the book, the four people who really form the pillars for your narrative of the book and what unfolds and how people's minds changed. Could you talk us through, perhaps as briefly as you can, the four main anchor characters in the book and um, perhaps if you could also share why do you choose them what are they meant to do in terms of the reflection of the big story and the trend that you are chronicling in this book um sure so uh, maybe I'll do two and then Shivani can do two. So we split it up here. Um, so the first one I think is um, Reverend Chu, Chu Yuming, um, who was involved. Um, you know, I mean, I, we chose him because he's, he's much older um, than all the other uh, people that we write about in the book. Um, you know, his life in a lot of ways mirrors kind of, you know, Hong Kong. He was born in Hong Kong, moved to the mainland, um, you know, uh, then ended up coming back to Hong Kong, kind of fleeing the persecution that, that was taking place um, in in China, um, and then gets involved in the pro-democracy movement around 1989, um, you know, was at Tiananmen Square, helped rescue some people from there to Hong Kong, then on to third countries in Operation Yellowbird. Um, and then through that, you know, he's kind of been at or part of almost all of the sort of big moments and, you know, pro-democracy movements in Hong Kong in 2014, um, you know, less so kind of a little bit less so in 20, 2019, given his given his age. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think we thought that he was just, um, you know, that his history kind of reflected a lot of Hong Kong's own history and the people of Hong Kong's own history. Um, and then uh, I guess kind of opposite of him uh, was Finn Lau, uh, a guy who was involved, um, you know, in the protest movement in an online kind of anonymous capacity at the beginning um, before he um, outed himself as the author of kind of the Lam Chow, uh, you know, burn with us mantra. Um, and I think, you know, we picked him because uh, we wanted someone who could talk and reflect a little bit about the online nature of the protest movement, the use of forums, and I think kind of get into a little bit of like, you know, are there limits to that, to that type of online participation? Can it have a real world impact? Um, you know, how good is it and effective is it for organizing? Um, and then I'll let you take the other two characters, I guess. Yeah, so um, I, I mentioned, you know, Tommy just now, um, and, and Tim mentioned Reverend True's role in, in Operation Yellow, but one of the most striking things, um, and which is, you know, sort of the anchor narrative also for our, our book, is that Tommy, after he gets uh, arrested in Hong Kong and is facing, uh, you know, potentially more than a decade in jail, uh, chooses to flee Hong Kong to Taiwan with four other people by boat. Uh, crossing the the, the Taiwan Strait um, and eventually, you know, does reach Taiwan and not to spoil the ending, but he uh, gets asylum, uh, gets resettled in the United States. And to us, sort of looking at at Reverend Chu and his role in Operation Yellowbird um, in 1989, right, where Hong Kong was a safe haven, where Hong Kong was was this real refuge, right, for you know, um, as it had been for generations, for for people fleeing uh, either persecution, famine, um, uh, you know, just awful conditions on the mainland. Um, it, by 2019, that that role of Hong Kong had really deteriorated, and Hong Kong itself became the place to flee. And so, I think we 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 really wanted to use those two kind of touch points, right, to show you know through Hong Kong's history how how that role morphed, right? Uh, Hong Kong is as the safe haven, and then you know the the the, the sort of breaking of that. Um, so that's you know a big reason why why we chose to highlight Tommy um, as opposed to you know obviously many many other sort of young frontline protesters that we could have um, featured. Um, and our last, but, but perhaps the most important um, character in the book is Gwyneth Ho, who was a journalist. Um, when the protests happened, she was studying uh, in Europe and, and back um, on her summer vacation uh, when she was, uh, you know, covering the events for Stan News. Um, and I think most people will remember her because she was um, beaten up in, in Yunlong um, on the July 21st, um, 2019, which was when uh, essentially pro Beijing thugs, uh, triad members, uh, sort of uh, attacked, um, you know, uh, protesters and sort of regular people at, at this uh, subway station. Uh, and I think, you know, we really wanted um, to, to sort of highlight her, not not just because uh, she was such an important part of this extremely pivotal day, right? I mean, Yunlong 7 to 1, it's like a definitive, right, for, for the movement, definitive for Hong Kong that year, right? Because I think it really was the day that shattered the trust that Hong Kong people had in, in the police and, and indeed in the government. Um, but Gwyneth herself is also, um, you know, very, very thoughtful about the way she looks at the movement, very thoughtful about the way she looks at her own role. Um, and in the end becomes the only, you know, one in our book, at least, um, who, who chooses, actively chooses jail over exile. Um, she could have left, but, um, you know, she chooses to stay and then gets arrested and swept up in this big national security case. Um, and I think, you know, by the end of the book, we really wanted readers to come away with this idea that there was really only two binaries for, for a lot of people who were so deeply involved in the movement, exile or, or jail, right? And and people made their calculations differently um, as things were sort of closing in. Thank you. That's actually very, very interesting. I think particularly when you talk about uh, somebody like Gwyneth, who at the start of your book, really, in a sense, was, and I meant no disrespect to her and nobody. She was just a student studying overseas, and paying attention to what happens in Hong Kong, to in the end choosing to stay and face the consequences that she knew would be very, very harsh. Mm -hmm. With somebody you mentioned somewhat in passing in the book, but perhaps not intentionally, presented in a somewhat contrasting light. And that was what happened to Joshua Wong that you have come out with interesting and important information indicating that when he knew the game was up, he did try to seek asylum in the United States 
unsuccessfully. <laughs> and in the end, have to face the music the way that Gwyneth did. <laughs> now here is a contrasting of one of Hong Kong's best known activist protest leader, perhaps not among the Braves, but in terms of the more measured weight of protesting, but a long standing one with a newcomer who really just came out. Was that intentional? I mean, what, what, what were you trying to bring out in highlighting that contrast in the book? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think part of it, there's probably multiple parts, but I'll talk about it a little and then and Shwani will probably add on some, I think. I mean, I think, I think you know, in Joshua's situation, um, you know, it was understandable sort of because his profile you know, he thought and, and, you know, the people around him, I think, also believed that he would be better served being outside of Hong Kong, right? That his that he had this international presence, that he had the international kind of uh, stage that very few people in, in Hong Kong had, right? Maybe him and, and, uh, and maybe one or two other people. Um, but but I think him by by far kind of the most prominent, right? Uh, so, you know, I think you saw him take up a more international role in the protest once he was, you know, released from jail. Uh, and certainly, I think trying to to leave Hong Kong was, um, you know, part part of of his thought process. From from what we understand, was that he would be much more uh, valuable to the movement and to continuing on advocacy about Hong Kong and about China from from abroad. Right. Right now, he's uh, obviously in jail. You know, we haven't seen you know or heard uh, you know publicly any kind of letters from him or anything like that. So you know. If if part of the plan um, for the authorities was to kind of you know silence him, it's certainly been effective. You know, had he landed somewhere else outside of Hong Kong, you know, I think you would see him a lot more in the news. I think you'd see him a lot in front of lawmakers. I think you'd see him, you know, really taking up this international lobbying position that he had kind of filled. Right. Um, so that was certainly sort of part of the the thought process there um, from from his side. Um, and then I think maybe Shwani can talk about Gwen's position. Yeah, and I mean, I think I think you know, it's not it wasn't like a direct sort of contrast, right? But different people just sat very differently with this idea of being in exile, right? I mean, Gwyneth, I think herself has written a lot about how she would have just never been at peace overseas, or she would have never been comfortable, or, 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 or you know, safe in her own mind, right? I think is is the way is the way she she put it, right? And it's an incredibly difficult sort of decision or or, or, or sort of pathway to kind of choose um but at the end of the day i mean i think and, and she's she's written about this publicly like she wrote that you know you have to you know do what's right by you right and 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 the decision of her being in exile would, would have never been sort of right by by her but i think primarily the reason that we included the 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 um situation with joshua and his asylum bid was to kind of show really the limits of how far the u.s was prepared to go uh when it came to offering a uh, safe haven and, and, and pathways to fleeing hong kongers and I mean, I think, you know, that's what we really wanted to kind of interrogate here, because obviously Washington, um, uh, as, as you remember, right, during the start of the protests or even, you know, through 2020, I mean, I think no other country sort of uh, 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 pledged as much support to the Hong Kong movement, right, when, including, you know, uh, lawmakers from the U.S. arriving on the streets of Hong Kong, um, like Josh Hawley and uh, Ted Cruz, you know, uh, actually being there among the protesters, right? I mean, it was kind of a stunning thing to to, to see. Um, and, you know, at the end of the day, we wanted to see whether those same people kind of fought as hard uh, for Hong Kong, not just in Joshua's case, but also, you know, more broadly for kind of uh, establishing a, a asylum pathway or immigration pathway for other Hong Kongers. And I mean, the truth is they, they really didn't. Right. And so that that's what we we were hoping to to kind of highlight by, um, you know, rep reporting that out. OK, thank you. That kind of leads to a question about whether the, the Braves or indeed the wider protest movement in Hong Kong being naive or did they really know what they were doing and they knew that they had no choice and the course of protest they took, whether it was the massive peaceful demonstration or mm. the substantially smaller part of people who were taking direct actions, that that was the only way forward. They knew what they were doing. They knew what they were going to expect. They knew what the Chinese government responses would be. And they knew the odds against them, which was the case. 
I think that some people um, who maybe had more exposure um, kind of to the mainland and a bit more kind of understanding uh, sometimes of, of the political system there and of Xi Jinping um, were a bit more aware of, of how uh, bad things could get. I think we, to circle back to Gwyneth, she's a person who I started interviewing well before we had this book idea. Um, and I think she was always very clear eyed uh, in her discussions with me and with other journalists about the risks involved here, right? That they were taking on, um, you know, a, a superpower, um, authoritarian government. You know, she, I think, was very, um, you know, again, clear eyed and kind of open and, and kind of knew that. Um, and I think that's true for um, some other people. Um, you know, that, that we've interviewed, that we've interacted with over the years. Um, and I'm talking about, I guess, kind of the, the you know, more well-known, you know, uh, pro-democracy lawmakers or activists here. Um, certainly, I do think then, then after that, there's a subset of people who totally, um, you know, from the same group of lawmakers and activists who totally, I think, misunder, uh, you know, misunderstood this and, and really, uh, uh, you know, didn't anticipate how bad things were going to get, that the national security law was going to happen. I think, you know, um, you know, you've seen some of them in, in court and, and some people that have been, I think, really, really kind of caught off guard, um, you know, by by what has occurred. So it's hard to know, you know, if how many people or what subset of people thought this or thought that, you know, I think in our conversations, it varies, right? There's some people who were very kind of prepared in a way for this. I think there's other people who were not at all, uh, you know, cognizant of how, of how, of how things could get. And I, I think, you know, just kind of bringing us back to the mindset that a lot of people were in in 2019, right? I think a lot of people just felt like they had to do this, you know? If 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 they didn't, then they couldn't sleep at night, they couldn't live with themselves, they couldn't face themselves in the mirror, you know? Like, that that mentality was, was very real. I mean, people were just kind of doing what they believed was right in that moment. And the questions that we're sort of talking about came much later. I mean, I think it, it was that, you know, a very weird period between, you know, the start of COVID, which was January of 2020, to the imposition of the national security law, that everyone was then trying to make that risk calculation in their mind, right? Okay, if I get arrested, how long would I be facing? Um, so on and so forth. But but I, I don't think anybody could have really been sort of prepared for like sort of the extent of the national security law. I mean, even today, when I talk to people that I interview for stories in Hong Kong, you know, at the present, and, and, and we kind of bring bring us back to that that mindset of that moment then, I mean, people were still judging their consequences by the Hong Kong legal system and the Hong Kong framework, right? Which was very, very different from what happened when the national security law, you know, sort of came into place. Um, and I think really, really upended that, including from, from a legal system point of view, where you're denied bail and, you know, you, you, you're you afraid that one day you even might get extradited back to China and, and so on, right? I think that that was a very new element that people were not prepared to deal with at all. Can I come back to you? Because the issue of naivety, if that is the right word for it, um, I think in a sense goes a bit deeper than that. Um, we all now criticize the harshness of the national security law, and it is draconian. I, I wouldn't disagree with that or argue against that. But given the history of the People's People's mm. Republic of China government, the way how they're doing it with the national security law is by no imagination the harshest way that they could have mm. responded. Um, they could have responded in the way that's similar to how they responded to the protests in Beijing in 1989. They didn't. Mm. And Hong Kong people of an earlier generation were deeply involved in supporting the protests in Beijing in 1989. And that was, in a sense, the birth of the mass yeah. ordinary yeah. demonstrations in Hong Kong. It was in response to the military crackdown in Beijing in June 1989. And for your new generation of activists and protesters in Hong Kong to have not taken on board that the worst case scenario would be something similar to Beijing 1989 as a possible uh, way of response from the Chinese authorities. That seems to suggest that they really were not thinking very hard about what they were dealing with, weren't they? 
And then the other dimension of the naivete is not so much with how the Chinese government will respond, but with how the Western governments would respond. Mm. Yeah. The idea and that Washington is going, coming to ride to Hong Kong's rescue, that London is going to send in the Royal Marines, that was never on the agenda. No, and, and I think, you know, part of this that, you know, that we've discussed, we don't write about it too much in the book, in the book, but I think, you know, it's certainly that there is a sort of boy who cried wolf factor, maybe, right, that after 1997, there wasn't, uh, you know, the great fears of the death of Hong Kong weren't, uh, you know, realized, right, that, you know, at, at midnight, and on, you know, at the handover, uh, it things that the next day didn't, change in a way that that people had kind of the, the most bearish look had been right and hong kong carried on and there were certainly incidents over time um that kind of rose the the, the alarm and, and and kind of you know obviously show that the basic law and and and, and the, so the declaration are being you know to, you know contorted and, and, and pulled a bit um but i definitely think that, that that part of that was maybe this that over the years for so many decades the death of hong kong had been foretold so many times and really every time uh, things had carried on in a way that for a lot of people wouldn't see drastically different. So I think there's a little bit of kind of um, maybe complacency over time um, that 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 things would, would that the status quo would kind of could kind of remain. Yeah. And I mean, just just to add to that, you know, on, on your point about about naivety. Right. I mean, I think there was this idea or, or actually this bravado that was present in 2019 that people actually did say to us, like, well, let let the tanks come in, like let everybody see what Beijing is really like, let everybody see what 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 China would would respond, right? Arguably, the 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 strategy of responding through a national security law that's so kind of draconian and sweeping and remaking the institutions and so on actually gives enough space for the international community to respond a little bit, but not force their hand to respond quite how they did after eighty nine. If 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 you see what I mean, right? I mean, I think that there were people who definitely told us they they would prefer this unambiguous sort of brutality because then the international response might be a little bit more unambiguous, right? Whereas today, what we see is actually sort of a desire to kind of get on with it, right? I mean, in 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 2020, there were sanctions, you know, obviously the, the, the BNO pathway was, was created by the UK and so on and so forth, but you really do see a normalization around Hong Kong, um, especially, you know, with the economic side of things and the economic engagement. Uh, coming back, and you do see a desire, right? Um, I, I think the even the, the British uh, Consul General said, right, we 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 can't have any more megaphone diplomacy. You know, we have to just uh, kind of you know work work together and and, and strengthen the economies, right? Um, and and I and I um, yeah, I, I I sometimes think about that, right? Uh, whether this this response, responding through kind of a legal way and sort of undercutting institutions and so on over like a, a dragged out sort of period, right? Um, is actually a much smarter way of responding than, than, than sort of the straight up brutality. So what did they really want? I mean, the, here we're really talking about the subset of the Braves, the people who were taking direct action, because they are the people who were, in a sense, pushing for the kind of response that you were talking about, that they could hope for that. Your mm -hmm. massive number of people who were protesting only peacefully and orderly, they were not doing action yeah. that they expect to trigger a response like that. So what were the Braves hoping to achieve by doing so? Just to show what? Well, I think, there was the just, I think there was just like a subset of people who really wanted the, the sort of quote unquote mirage of Hong Kong gone, right? For it to no longer be a place that, you know, um, has a financial system that plays the, the role that it does uh, for China, right? I mean, I think I think the sort of burn with us sort of mentality among a certain subset was was very serious, right? Like if 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 we are to be punished, then we have to drag the whole thing kind of down with it, right? And and I think that people who really would have wanted to see that in 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 that year, yeah. And I mean, I think some of this is not even up to speculation, right? Some of it was laid out by you know Professor Tai and and, and the thirty five plus kind of scheme, right? I mean, that was ostensibly the next kind of step in, in moving the protest from the streets into, you know, uh, LegCo and into kind of like the halls of, of at least the halls of Hong Kong power, right? Um, so I don't think it's a totally kind of abstraction, right? There was um, a plan uh, of sorts. And I do think, um, you know, had things played out differently, 
that, you know, they could have gotten that majority and, you know, how far down the line they would have gotten with kind of monkey wrenching the system and, uh, you know, um, voting down the budget and things like that, that they were detailed. I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm sure Beijing would have intervened at some point. Um, but I do think that 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 35 plus getting those seats, you know, if COVID doesn't happen, uh, if Carrie Lam doesn't, you know, hold off the election. Uh, these are a lot of ifs, I realize. But, uh, you know, the national security law doesn't come in. You know, I think that at the time that that, that plan was hatched uh, felt realistic. It felt doable, uh, at least parts of it. But need we not actually make a distinction between the classic civil disobedience acts that Benny Dye was proposing, uh, trying to use the institution in place, including the elected elements of the legislature to yeah. incapacitate the government mm -hmm. and bring out the problems. That's civil disobedience. Mm -hmm. The direct actions that the Braves were taking in the streets, throwing stones, throwing Molotov cocktails, was a very different set of actions from the civil disobedience of Benny Dai or the other protests. So what were they trying to achieve? Right. So I mean I think I think that's true. I think that on the surface they're they're obviously different actions. But I do think they have to look at the support uh that, that went across those, right? That the people that were involved in 35 plus were also not you know strongly condemning the more the more radical elements right this is a the, there was there was still broad support even the the district council election that happened right after Holly U, right which was the worst um you know strategically a terrible idea you know for the movement from a standpoint of the arrests from the, the crazy violence that happened there that was really extremely dangerous i mean it's shocking that nobody was killed during that uh you know event um but in terms of you know what they were kind of trying to achieve i, th I do think it is also uh, a challenge. In, in some ways, I think the Hong Kong protest is extremely simple, and the fact that it started with one demand and then it went to five, uh, and that was, you know, and 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 those, and it was that in that sense, it's very clear cut. Um, but in terms of speaking for, I guess, what every single person wanted, I think is hard. I think, um, you know, it ultimately, you know, as Shivani said, I think they wanted to show, um, you know, show the world and how they would do that. Uh, is different. I think, you know, sanctions were, were a big part of it. I think there was a lot of push there that that people like HSBC, like institutions would, would get sanctioned, uh, that, that that they would kind of show that that Hong Kong and China had become, uh, you know, so close that, that they couldn't be treated differently. And again, some of these actions um, were, you know, achieved that, you know, when, when Pompeo said that, that Hong Kong is not fully, you know, autonomous anymore uh, and it has a policy change from the United States. You know, some of those things did, you know, did indeed uh, happen. I guess it's just a question of sort of how far and what contortions they were going to go to. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we are now 40 minutes, 41 minutes past the hour. I'll perhaps raise two more questions with you and then I will be bringing in questions from the uh, audience. And sure. so far we have eight questions from eight anonymous attendees. Um, nobody has feel comfortable to um, identify oneself, but I would certainly encourage those who feel that they could do it, give some in indication of who you are. Uh, and I'll come to your questions next, uh, later. The other question I want to put to you is about the four anchor characters and how they relate to your focus of the book as Among the Braves. Now, the simplistic interpretation is that among your four anchor individuals, Tommy was clearly one of the Braves. Mm -hmm. He was a direct action type. Mm. That's easy, straightforward. Gwyneth was an incredibly courageous person, and she was not leaving it, it to any kind of interpretations because she consciously chose to stay to face the music for in fact relatively little that she was directly actively involved in. Yeah. And in, in, in many ways that is one's classic definition of a very brave individual. What about the other two? 
Finn was essentially an online protester, contributing more like ideas than taking uh, any kind of real protest in Hong Kong or choosing to face the consequences. Uh, Reverend Chu is an incredibly admirable person who has done a lot over a long period of time. Yeah. But in the end, he, he was not that directly actively involved in the 2019 protest. And in the end, he decided that he needs to relocate out of Hong Kong for his own and his family's safety. How does that come in to anchor your book, which the which is focused on among the braves? I, are we looking at very different dimensions of what being brave means in the context of Hong Kong mm -hmm. in the 2019 to 2022? So I mean, as as you as you noted in in the beginning, right? Braves has obviously a double meaning, right? So one is the the subset of of the Braves itself, which meant something very specific in the movement in in twenty nineteen. But I think we we did want to use the title to nod to the the fact that obviously anyone who was participating in the movement, you know, throughout the generations, was in fact doing something very courageous and very brave, right? I mean, the 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 the, the courage and 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 uh, you know the the, the sort of medal of, of the Hong Kong protest movement was really you know something remarkable and was kind of on display for I think the whole world to see. I mean, it was really one of the world's most enduring uh, pro democracy movements, right? In in that year and and every weekend after every weekend after every weekend, um, you know, we saw it evolving and, and changing in, in in different ways. I mean, you know that that the phrase, right? The brothers uh, climbing the mountain each to his own ability, right? Uh, like that, we we really felt that the four characters sort of um, exemplified that, right? Because they all did such different things and they spoke to such different aspects of the movement. I mean, Finn was indeed uh, online, but in fact, the online activism that 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 they uh, and, and you know stand with Hong Kong sort of pioneered in that movement led to some real world actions, right? I mean, you saw, um, you know, uh, observation missions from the UK, you saw people being uh, sort of um, uh, essentially uh, pushing for for sanctions and further relationships through the formation of, of IPEC, for example, which is the interparliamentary alliance um, of, of lawmakers, right, all across the world who um, have, you know, come together to take quite a strong stance against China. I mean, those were all pretty direct consequences of, of what they were doing that year. And the price that you know they've paid for that sort of individually, you know, uh, it has been has been quite high, right? I mean, uh, Finn was related to to just sort of Andy Lee, who is part of the same uh, group, uh, who today is um, you know uh, one of the key witnesses in in the Jimmy Lai trial. So they all kind of link together, right? We we wanted to to talk about this whole sort of kind of ecosystem and and, and this whole this whole world, right? And and Reverend Chu, I mean, for somebody you know of his age who really came into this movement through the church. And through being a pastor, right? I mean, the the what he and his family have had to kind of endure because of his, you know, generational long commitment to democracy, and 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 let's not forget his compatriots, you know, Li Chukian, Martin Lee, and so on, who are all still in Hong Kong and all sort of, you know, elderly, but are sort of facing such consequences for how they've pushed for very basic things in Hong Kong, right? I mean, I I think to us that that all sort of exemplifies the the sort of courage of this movement. Okay, last question for me before I go to the by now 13 different interventions. What would you like your readers to see as the key takeaways from the book? Um, yeah, I mean, I'll start. I mean, I think, I think that, you know, for us would be, um, you know, seeing the people, um, you know, of Hong Kong and kind of, I think, understanding, um, you know, as you know, uh, through your work and, and as a historian that, that you know, that the people have been, you know, very much marginalized and left out of discussions about their own future. And, uh, you know, the agency, uh, you know, has at many key moments in, in history been taken away from, from the people of Hong Kong um, in terms of, you know, uh, colonialism and then Chinese rule. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, is certainly one uh, one part of it. Um, and then I think we'd also, you know, like people to look at it and kind of maybe, um, you know, interrogate uh, what kind of, you know, allies or, or promises are made by by foreign governments to uh, to people going through situations like in Hong Kong, kind of 
you know, how much the world really stands up to those promises, especially the U.S., um, you know, stands up to the kind of what they're preaching, um, you know, when it becomes a, a challenge, when things don't go the way that, 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 that people, you know, want, um, you know, will they really kind of take up and do difficult things? And in the case of the United States, we've seen them not really do that, right? This became the Hong Kong issue became one of kind of uh, democracy and a chance for some photo shoots. And then it became an immigration issue in the United States. And when that happened, we saw a lot of the people uh, who were the biggest champions, the most vocal proponents of, of Hong Kong totally turn their back on people um, that they've been advocating for. Um, so I think, you know, there's there's a lot of, uh, you know, I, I hope some kind of, you know, uh, through the reporting and through the writing in there, you know, taking a hard look at kind of uh, both the Trump and Biden administrations and, and the U.S. more broadly, and kind of what they've promised uh, or I don't want to say promised, but what they've what they've kind of preached to, to the people of Hong Kong, what they've held up. Yeah. And just to add two more things that I think, um, you know, we want people to take away. One is, you know, how um, like people can be very complicit in the eroding uh, of these institutions, even though they seem sort of Western educated and, and sort of, you know, relatable, right? I mean, one of the things that was really remarkable that we always heard from, from diplomats in, in Hong Kong is, uh, you know, foreign diplomats in Hong Kong was how much the Hong Kong government was sort of like them, right? You know, studied at the same institutions, partly served under the British. So, you know, they're consummate civil servants. They can understand how the West works. They understand sort of global financial systems and so on. These same people were were, were, were the enablers, really, of, of, of Beijing's crackdown, right? I mean, you don't need to be a Xi Jinping kind of character who obviously went through the Cultural Revolution, was exiled to a cave to kind of, you know, be complicit in 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 in, in, in sort of lead the erosion of, of democratic institutions, right? And I think that has some really um, important implications uh, for, for the whole world, really, right? I mean, if, even if you look at the US and, and sort of Trump and the people surrounding him. I mean, you see that 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 people, um, you know, can actually be very uh, willing collaborators, right, in the erosion of democratic institutions, uh, even though they have sort of grown up understanding, you know, what democracy is, right, and 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 benefited from from those systems. Um, and and I guess the last point I would make is is sort of the fragility of of institutions, right. I mean, I think a lot of people have still been very shocked at the way the the Hong Kong legal system has has sort of been. Kind of corroded and 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 exploited right in in the wake of, of the national security law and i think that is something that people had a lot of faith in right even if they you know believed other things could be sort of um you know uh, malleable like for example the schools and so on and so forth and those threats you know have been known to hong kong people before right you know national education and so on i think people really did have faith in the courts right but now you see the courts and and, and you know the doj and the prosecutors being you know very very much hand in hand um, with with sort of the the crackdown that's happening from Beijing, right? And I think, um, in some ways, you know, going back to what you said about Tiananmen and the crack, the nature of the crackdown, perhaps you know the 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 sort of nature of the, what we've seen in Hong Kong is has really had you know big lessons, right, for how how you can manipulate systems without needing to you know rely on force. Okay, the first question I pick is from an anonymous attendee. What is your sense of how regular Hong Kong residents view the protest in retrospect? Mm. We went from a pretty open society with the ability to protest, post freely on social media, read free and robust criticisms in the Apple's Daily, to now living with the consequences of a post-protest environment where we are too fearful to post on social media. Our regular media is gone and we no longer protest about anything with the risk of having our lives being ruined by overzealous police. Hong Kong is a different place. Our youth are in crisis and the economy is in free fall. Was it all worth it? That's a big question to start with. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think um, for for us, for, you know, the characters uh, in our book and the people that we interviewed, um, you know, I, I think most of them uh, would say that it probably, it, that it was, um, you know, worth it. And, and I think that that is, 
uh, it, it was worth it in in the sense that at the time, um, you know, like Shivani said, there was this drive to do something, right? This whole societal, um, you know, push to to be part of this, to do to do something, right? Um, and I think when you're lifted up, when you're a million people strong on the, on the street, you know, that um, is life changing and, 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 and motivating and feels very worth it. Now, I think uh, in that moment. Right. And then I think if we look back now um, from some the position some people are in living, you know, alone in foreign countries because they had to leave Hong Kong, um, you know, restarting their lives and new jobs. You know, that's that's a totally different kind of situation and a totally different um kind of question uh to to ask i think and to and to look at to, to look at those kind of two very different um sort of time frames um i think that that there is a and this is a bit of a divergence but i think there's um it's something that's on my mind we're in taipei at the moment you know there is a thought that that nothing was was achieved from this but i do think that that's kind of uh selling the movement you know short in the way that when you look at the implications for again taiwan for existence right where one country two systems is will never probably be, you know, enacted here in the shorter medium term because of the consequences in Hong Kong. You know, it changed the course of history here, um, you know, with the election of the DPP again uh, in, in 2020. Um, so, you know, I think when we're talking about was it worth it, were there things that were achieved, um, you know, it's a big uh, it's a big question. There's a lot of layers to it. And I think it's also deeply personal for certain people. Right. Um, I, again, certainly every person that we that we tracked in our book, I think, absolutely their response would be that we would go back and that we would do it again. I think I think if I could just add a, a little bit to this, you know, this was a question we indeed posed to I think a lot of the people we, we spoke yeah. to actually and 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 spoke for many hours about this question. I think, you know, when when you look at somebody like Tommy who who started uh, actually uh protesting in the anti extradition protests uh quite as early as April, you know, um when he used to leave those smaller protests, he would feel very lonely, like okay, there were so few people, maybe I'm a fringe kind of in my mentality maybe there are not many people who, who feel the way i do or who have the same feelings and desires for hong kong's dreams for hong kong as, as i do but by you know june july august i think what we saw was the creation of a community that like you know was 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 reiterating to people no you're not alone right what you're feeling what your emotions and your heart what your desires are for hong kong we millions of us feel the same way too right and i think you know, to bring us back to that moment, you know, that was a very, very special kind of thing that was created in, in Hong Kong in 2019 in, in the movement, right? And obviously what's happened since is I think obviously the state and Beijing and the Hong Kong government have worked to to erode those bonds and eradicate those bonds, right? But if, if we remember that they were actually still there and that there are a lot of people who feel the same, they just can't express that anymore, right? I think that, you know, gives us a lot of hope and a lot of strength even today. Let me move on. The next question I pick comes from uh, Stephen Wines, whom you probably almost yes. didn't know. As Shibani said, there was no central organizer in 2019. In fact, there was no central organization. The slogan, no big platform, was a response to what the protesters thought was a weakness of the Umbera movement of 2014 with clearly identifiable and identified leaders. So do you think that the absence of central leadership mm. was a major fall of strategy in 2019? So, yeah, I mean, I, I, think, um, I think it's understandable kind of, you know, why that formula or that kind of makeup became popular given what happened again in, uh in 2014 the disagreement some in you know infighting that took that took place right it's a very kind of uh in a way more democratic uh you know movement in itself right we saw in real time as people kind of voted on on, on telegram and on lhkg just you know just decisions of the day in the moment of where they should protest what they should do where they should go so i think that uh you know that especially that coordination element um was fascinating to watch um you know what steve's getting at and I, I i think that there is some some kind of probing to be done here is about the limitations of of uh leaderless protests right um that there wasn't opportunities for um you know not just the hong kong government 
But, you know, we know from our reporting of, you know, diplomats, of other people who wanted a better understanding of what was going on, who wanted to talk to someone so they could bring what was happening back to their governments who didn't kind of know where to go and there was no one to kind of talk to, right? Um, and so I think that uh, from a, it makes it a challenge when uh, if there's an opportunity to kind of negotiate or talk or, or discuss kind of de-escalation, it's like, who's the point person here? Like, who do we talk to? That's one issue. I think the second issue is, when there is this vacuum, you know, for, for the leadership, that deliberately so, some people who aren't kind of uh, have the best interests in, in, in uh, of, of a lot of people uh, in their hearts kind of can sometimes step in and kind of proclaim themselves to be uh, posi- in, in leadership positions, right? Um, who, you know, aren't agreed upon by people who are kind of, you know, faking it a bit, I guess. Um, so I think that that it leaves open to kind of imposters a little bit, uh, if that makes sense. Um, and, and I think we saw some people kind of, uh, you know, put their hands up and speak for the movement at times and say things or do things that were, you know, pretty foolish. Um, and uh, and again, I think that's a consequence of really not having, um, you know, a strong kind of uh, leader to direct things. So I think there's certainly, you know, a benefit from it um, that we saw uh, with the spontaneity, with the way that it moved, with the democracy aspect of it. And then I guess absolutely I think there's there's limitations, um, you know, to to kind of um, what that kind of movement can look like. Okay, um, let me now read out a more like a comment than a question, but I certainly like to see whether you would like to respond to that comment. And that comment comes from an anonymous attendee. Two features of the kind of structure of feelings at the time of the protest among the protesters need to be highlighted in addition to what have been discussed. One, the very deep disillusion and feeling of lack of representation and the idea that former forms of less confrontational protest had not given any result. Yeah. Two, the fact that many protesters had gone through some kind of political socialization by taking part in some form of protests or events earlier on, like mm-hmm. the 2014 Ambera movement or the annual June 4th vigil. And the kind of harsh reactions of the police to the protesters at the very stage, early stage of the 2019 protests from June 12th onward. Yep. will have triggered a further radicalization among some protesters. Would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one thing that we haven't explicitly dis- discussed, but colored everything that we saw in 2019 and indeed reported on the book was the police response, right? I mean, I think it's when you had that kind of erosion of trust in, in authorities, uh, and, and, and in particular the police, um, people were really sort of finding ways of going into themselves, right, and, and and responding to what they saw as persecution of other Hong Kongers by themselves, right? And so that's why you have more kind of like vigilante actions, especially after 7 to 1, uh, where there was this idea, right? Um, and I did a story at the time that, you know, uh, even like white collar, you know, people who worked as accountants and bankers were learning how to make Molotov cocktails because they felt, okay, if the police are, you know, attacking our, our people, if, if, if it's sort of quote unquote war on, on the streets, then we need to find ways to defend ourselves, right? And I think that that you know I I I read quite a lot at the time, um, you know about uh kind of the troubles and and in Belfast and and you know we 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 never saw that kind of extent in Hong Kong, but it was trending in that direction, right? One action from the police, one action from the protesters, one action from the police, one from the protesters, and it the radicalization ticked up and ticked up and ticked up till we got to to poly you, right? Um, and 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 I think that that was a spiral that we felt like we were locked in um, all all through those months. Right. Let me now move to somebody who is a very long term resident in Hong Kong, uh, but not born there. The Hong Kong movement has been so suffocated and suppressed that is essentially dead locally apart from the incredibly widespread simmering resentment. You also make the point that Western support has evaporated and international attention 
has very much moved on, like over to Gaza, Ukraine, etc. Yeah. And so many Hong Kongers who have been able to have left. Hong Kong is now simply Shenzhen South, isn't it? Where can Hong Kong identity and mm -hmm. perhaps in position uh, in bracket pseudo autonomy go from here? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I, I think this is something else we've, we've discussed recently um, because we've been seeing a lot of Hong Kongers and people, Hong Kongers that have moved to Taiwan. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that that one, if you want to call it a silver lining, I'm not sure it's a silver lining, it's something that, you know, this has sparked, um, you know, an interest, I think, um, in some academic institutions, uh, in the study of Hong Kong, of Hong Kong history, of Cantonese. Um, you know, I think we've seen new programs pop up at some universities um, and some places. So I think that is, is something that's been been kind of taken out of this, that there is an interest um you know there there was and i, I hope it, hope it will stay um of kind of you know studying hong kong and looking at hong kong um so I, you know i think that's kind of a little little bit of maybe an answer to that question um but in terms of kind of wholesale you know replication or finding that um you know i think it's a challenge i think there's again um things that are happening um you know we were in toronto for a book talk um you know i think there's a multi-generational kind of hong kong uh, community there uh, you know, talking to them and seeing some of the stuff that they had done in the past years around like cultural events and a Hong Kong fair that had joined like thousands of people. You know, I think we find those things very heartening, right? Um, that the diaspora community, um, you know, there there's a tendency, I think, particularly by pro-Beijing and state media in Hong Kong to write about the diaspora community as total failures, that everyone's going there and they're losing their jobs and they're not making any money and they're all depressed. Um, you know, that's certainly not all of it. Um, you know, there are plenty of success stories there are, you know, these kind of exciting, um, you know, things that are happening. So I'm not, you know, I think we found it in, in you know, doing a the book tour and visiting kind of various Hong Kong communities across the U.S. and in Canada. You know, we were, you know, certainly emotional time, but I think we were both heartened um, by some of the stuff we saw and some of the people we met and some of the things that are, um, you know, taking place. Yeah. And I mean, just to add to that, like in the UK and in Canada, both, I mean, Hong Kong is there's so many of them that they're actually a voting block in a constituency in, in certain districts. Right. I mean, there are certain districts where there are enough Hong Kongers that they are politically relevant to whatever local dynamic is is sort of going on there. And I and I, I do think in that sense, right, as with all sort of di uh, diaspora and, and, and exile kind of communities, you know, there is a way to make a make a difference within your your local community, you know, sort of wherever you go. Right. So I, I think I don't think this. Um, this sort of like, actually, I think, you know, if if it's true that people in Hong Kong are, are very suppressed, which it is true, I think people who have left feel this really strong desire to keep Hong Kong identity and, and to keep, you know, the, the the story and kind of the spirit of Hong Kong alive, right? And you see a lot of efforts to do that across the diaspora. Yeah. And I, and I think one last thing I think that, we'll, that I'll touch on that we saw a little bit of too is that, um, you know, a uh, greater interest amongst Hong Kongers, uh, you know, in the diaspora community to connect with other um, you know, groups, whether it's talking about what's happening in Xinjiang or with Tibet or with just kind of, you know, pro-democracy activists from from the mainland. You know, I think Hong Kong, they didn't have a diaspora community in that in that sense for a long time. Or, or if they did, it was very small. You know, I think they're kind of new to the scene. And I think that they, it's interesting, you know, and I think for us, uh, it's been, again, heartening to see some of our friends and people that we know, um, you know, learning about these other communities, you know, connecting with them, um, you know, building this kind of coalition. I think you see it a lot on, you know, college on some college campuses. Um, yeah. So again, I, I mean, I think I get where, you know, the person who's asking the question is coming from, um, you know, given kind of the downbeat feeling of all of this. Um, but, uh, but certainly I think there are some sort of hopeful moments and, and things that we've seen. Next question from another anonymous attendee. Isn't Hong Kong about working hard and earning money? Why does democracy matter? It wasn't yeah. that democratic under British colonial rule. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this was something that we, uh, you know, as we, we looked back at a lot of news articles, right, to do research for this book, 
um, there were so many uh, sort of foreign correspondents coming in in, in the 80s uh, around, especially around Tianwen, asking people that um, saying like, oh, you know, aren't you more concerned about your sort of economic uh, uh, sort of future and trajectory? Why, why are you guys suddenly so impassioned about what's going on in, in, in Beijing in, in, in uh, you know, in 1989? I mean, I think, um, uh, as you pointed out, um, you know, Professor, like, 1989 was really sort of the the birth right of the modern sort of pro democracy movement in in Hong Kong. I think that was sort of the the moment where all the fears and anxieties about what things would look like under Beijing were were, were very very real and and very true, right? And and when people started interrogating like wait, why has there been this handover that we haven't had any sort of direct role in and any sort of, you know, direct say in, right? I mean Nobody's arguing that Hong Kong was was a democracy under the British. Um, the the many of the worst laws, including sedition and and so on, are in, in fact holdovers, right, from British colonial times. It's not a binary between uh, you know what's 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 better or, or or what's worse, right? But I think you know there was this idea of of disenfranchisement throughout the generations, right? And if there was this one promise, um, which you know, is a political thing, right? Being able to vote for your own leader, but in fact also has an economic element to it. I'm from Singapore. And even when I talk to a lot of the pro-establishment in Hong Kong, they, they would love to tell me about how, you know, Lee Kuan Yew came to Hong Kong to study public housing, uh, you know, uh, models and see how that could be applied to Singapore, you know, back in the back in the 60s. Um, but really, I mean, it, it is it is true that like to get a house, even public housing in Hong Kong, the wait's very long. You know, it's one of the most difficult real estate markets in the world still today. I mean, people did feel like their their own economic aspirations, their own sort of growth was limited because the government wasn't working for them and working for the things they wanted, right? And so I think I think it's very hard to separate that idea of people's political aspiration and people's economic aspiration too, because a lot of people saw this as totally linked and, and, and very tied together. Next question, something completely different. Another anonymous attendee. To what extent do you see Hong Kong, the Hong Kong movement and its seething but now suppressed public sentiment a potential beginning of the end of the Communist Party of China? With the effective dissolution of the movement as the moment for pushing changes in the mainland now passed, is Hong Kong recoverable as a distinct political and jurisdictional entity. Uh, in terms of you know the 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 bit there about the about the mainland and, and and the end of it, no, I mean I think no because we we saw you know the white paper protests that they kind of popped up in the mainland around COVID and the lockdowns in Shanghai. Um, you know I think that that was a moment. Um, a big moment, right? I mean, I think that showed, uh, and it certainly showed some people in Hong Kong were very skeptical uh, about, you know, people in the mainland and their kind of, uh, you know, thoughts and wishes and feeling towards the government, that there are, um, you know, feelings out there um, of resentment and anger uh, towards the government. I think sometimes people in Hong Kong, uh, and maybe not just Hong Kong elsewhere, don't understand how difficult it is to voice those uh, opinions in China, and how huge the consequences are for that, right? I think a very naive thing that we heard from U.S. officials from other people over the time is, you know, if China, why don't the people just stand up and fight, something like that, right? Um, which is incredibly kind of remarkably uh, naive and, uh, and foolish thing to say, right? Um, so I think um, that there is, uh, you know, at times, uh, you, you know, uh, an appetite for for pushing back, for protests, for 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 talking back to the, to the government. We did see that uh, in the white paper protests. In terms of, you know, Hong Kong's, you know, distinct identity, you know, a, a lot of obvious, you know, the identity I think will live on in, in Hong Kongers, but I think in terms of the place itself, when you look at, you know, obviously a lot of focus on 2047, but I think, again, something that we've discussed a lot recently is like, is 2047, you know, has that, does that date hold as much meaning now as it did, say, 10 years ago? And my response would be probably no, because you see these large-scale infrastructure projects that are happening, um, this kind of physically changing Hong Kong to draw it closer, right, with the northern metropolis, with the Lantau Islands. You know, by the time we get to 2047, how much will have to change that next kind of that 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 year? Or how how close will they already be? The two places already be by the time we reach that that point, right? You know, is it still kind of this big date 
uh, on the calendar? Yes, yeah, certainly. But I think that, that the overall kind of importance of it has been diminished a little bit because of, uh, you know, what's happened with the national security law, what's going to continue to happen with Article 23, with, again, the physical integration of the two places. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm a little less kind of, uh, I guess, upbeat on that on that one. Okay. Next question from um, Santos Curie. Do you see Hong Kong becoming a separate identity like Taiwan in the short to medium term? Or is or is is its population cowered down cowed down now? Uh I think they had that 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 sense of of identity um very strongly right and i think that's what we saw manifested in in 2019 but the the reality is that obviously the legal framework around taiwan and around hong kong is 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 sort of totally different right at the end of the day hong kong was always under beijing's jurisdiction right whereas taiwan is in fact not so you know i think that 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 is is, is sort of a fundamental thing that makes the places two places a, a, a little bit hard to to kind of directly compare in that way. But I think, you know, you, you do see um, Hong Kong is also trying to preserve their identity. One thing that we didn't we didn't kind of mention is is a lot of activism around Cantonese, right? And and the Cantonese language and and, and sort of strengthening uh, you know, Cantonese as part of the, the the Hong Kong identity. I mean, I think those those efforts will still um, you know, sort of continue kind of among among people. But um, you know, I think also if you look at immigration stats and you look at what's kind of happening currently in, in Hong Kong, um, you know, as it becomes sort of less, um, you know, I mean, the fact is a lot of businesses have moved away from Hong Kong, right, um, to Singapore uh, primarily, but but to other cities, because, you know, if you're a tech company or if you're a company dealing with something sensitive, now you feel like you're not protected if you're in, in Hong Kong compared to being in the mainland. So you either be on the mainland or you 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 de-risk de from you know mainland China and Hong Kong both right so there are a few expats coming in that's that's a fact and a lot of these talent schemes and talent visas are being reserved for people coming in uh, from mainland China who you know in comparison Hong Kong is still much freer and much more open than mainland China right I mean that 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 I think continues to be true to 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 quite a large extent especially if you're not involved in any way in uh, sort of political you know sort of activism or political parties or political activities in Hong Kong. So um, I think that what's going to happen is, is you see the blurring of Hong Kong identity more and more within the city itself, right? Um, because more and more immigration and, and is borne out in the statistics is coming from the mainland. Hong Kong also has a declining birth rate. So they're going to have to backfill, right? A lot of what, what they want their population sort of um, uh, numbers to be, uh, you know, from, from this mainland migration, right? And so I think, I think that's going to change also the look and feel of Hong Kong in the next few decades, next generation. Sorry about the phone. No worries. Next question is a bit of a rhetorical question, but let me put that to you anyway. Do people in Hong Kong want to be rich and live in an orderly and stable country, or do they want to live in a poor, chaotic, democratic country? Is, is it a binary? Yeah, I mean, I, I think they want to live uh, in a place where they have a say in their own kind of leadership and their own future. Um, you know, I mean, that's that's not speculation. I mean, we have plenty of data from from years and years and years to back that up. Right. Uh, again, I think this goes back to uh, probably one of the, the you know, there's plenty of bad kind of tropes and cliches and misunderstandings about Hong Kong. The worst is probably uh, one pushed by uh, for many years by Lao Tzu Kai that the, the people of Hong Kong are not political. Right. I mean, this is an absolute kind of falsehood. Uh, and uh, and I think that that goes back to this, that this is, is either or, right? Um, and I think that also ignores the fact uh, of the politics involved in the Hong Kong economy. You know, why did they have this yawning, massive wealth gap? Why is the, uh, you know, the, the land crisis that's been simmering in Hong Kong for decades never been solved, right? Why have, you know, if, if that was really the only issue underpinning the protests, as Beijing and pro-Beijing figures in Hong Kong said for so long, why not fix it? Because that would be mean taking on these, you know, vested interests of tycoons and pro-Beijing companies, right? Um, so I, I think that it's kind of a total misnomer and total joke to try to cleave those two things off, the economy and politics from, from each other, and also to claim that you can have one and not have the other. Next question, again, somewhat in parallels to the previous one, but from a different angle. 
another anonymous attendee, who is pushing the democratic agenda in Hong Kong? The Americans or the EU? Soros. No, <laughs> I mean, uh, come on. Uh, I think uh, the people of Hong Kong were the ones pushing it, right? Um, you know, this was, uh, you know, the, the 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 people of Hong Kong. There's no, you know, black hand or, or foreign forces behind that. You know, that not only is untrue, it robs Hong Kong people again uh, of their agency. Um, you know, and this is the same kind of narrative we see around Jimmy Lai, that he's some sort of, you know, puppet master, that he was the one who kind of commanded people to the street. This was a, a movement that was born out of the Hong Kong people's own mindsets, their own desires, their own wants, uh, nobody else. And, and just to add to that, you know, I think we spent a lot of time in our book uh, really documenting the, the the early sort of protests and, and, and kind of the rise of the momentum around the anti-extradition bill, um, and particularly focused on the former chief executive, Carrie Lam, her role, her responsibility, her personality, uh, and indeed her missing of many, many off-ramps um, at, at the start of the protest, right, which kind of blocked us into this sort of escalation and and, and, and kind of radicalization pattern that, that I referred to earlier. Um, and I think, you know, we spent quite a lot of time documenting that within the book to show that so much of what happened in Hong Kong was truly a local response to a local issue. It wasn't even a, a push by Beijing at that, that point, right? I mean, the extradition bill, as we document in our book, was Carrie Lam's idea and her initiator, right? And so I think, I think you know, you know what, what we saw was, was really a local political issue that kind of grew and grew and grew from then. Yeah. Next question Completely different. Have the ethnic minorities in Hong Kong participated in the democracy movement? Or is it mainly an ethnic Chinese movement who were more radicalized? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, one of the most kind of interesting, I think, uh, things that, that that I observed during, during the protest was um, you know, Jimmy Sham, a uh, pro-democracy uh, activist, convener of the Civil Human Rights Front, you know, was attacked. Um, you know, he's left kind of bloodied on the street. Um, you know, and at the time, um, there was a kind of a lot of rumors and speculation that South Asian people of South Asian de the, you know, descent were behind it or they were hired thugs or someone had put them up to it. Um, and so uh, in a protest that followed that, you saw like a real outreach, um, kind of a really fascinating thing happen. Um, where there was a real effort, I think, to kind of buy a lot of people from Hong Kong to kind of uh, learn a bit more about, you know, the South Asian population, about the, you know, people that were living uh, in Hong Kong, many of them for a long time. Um, so, you know, there was tours that that the people put together of Chunky Mansion, um, you know, where people went there, people who had lived in the area for a long time, who had never been inside, right? Uh, that had, you know, these awful stereotypes about about what kind of place it was, who went and met people uh, who went and met ethnic minorities, who walked around, who got to know people, right? And so I think those moments um, are to us probably the most kind of memorable and interesting and say the most about kind of the Hong Kong movement, right? Uh, and they didn't get a ton of coverage, but if you were there, if you saw them happen, you know, on the streets, I think those were kind of one of the more kind of special and, and kind of really cool things that we saw take place. Yeah, and I think that that really gets to the heart of like what it means to be a Hong Konger, right? And I think, you know, in, in, in 2019, 2020, you know, there really was a sense that people who were sort of standing on, on, on the side of, you know, democracy and fairness and, and, and you know, all of the, the, the values that, you know, the, the movement championed, you were a Hong Konger, right? No matter what you, you look like or no matter who, who you are, as long as you, you love the place and you cared about the place, you know, um, I think I think you were you, you were sort of a big part of the fold in, in that way, right? And I think that was, um, yeah, and, and there are obviously many, many communities who, who, who call themselves Hong Kongers, right? And, 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 and who've been there for generations too. Next question, somebody who's actually read your book, clearly, mm. also anonymous. In, in your book, you wrote about Hong Kong government and the police knew about the Yuan Long attacks beforehand. Also, the book wrote, writes that a government political assistant participated at a banquet and gave the participants a specific dress code before the attacks happened. In my experience working in the media field in Hong Kong, 
it is difficult to get in touch with such sources. So my question is, as a foreign correspondent, how do you verify the information you gathered, especially when it is related to the government and local organizations and even the triad organizations? Um, yeah, so in, in this case, obviously, because we had a much longer lead time with, with the book, right, we had a lot of time to actually uh, travel to where our sources were, to have conversations with them in person, to actually verify looking at their um, evidence, right? So looking at, you know, messages that they may have had, um, so on and so forth. With the with the banquet, um, that was also public information. Um, actually, quite a lot of people posted uh, about events around Yunlong. I think not realizing that maybe people would look at their Facebook and eventually find that all out uh, later on when 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 something happened. Uh, and you know, as as is journalistic practice, we obviously reached out to all sources concerned before the publication of the book, so that um, the government, especially, had had the right to to kind of respond. Um, and uh, you know, we 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 made sure that you know the the book was also fact checked fact checked externally um and somebody could review all, all the evidence you know we presented i mean i think we we kind of knew we wanted to to uh write a book that was unimpeachable right any any factual inaccuracy any error could really cast doubt on on the whole thing and and when our sort of motivation or our goal is to kind of make sure that history and the truth is recorded and and and, and we're really you know going against right this like kind of narrative control that's coming from the state we, we really needed to make sure everything was very accurate so we we worked very hard to 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 ensure that. Um, and I think you know, on 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 the kind of Yunlong um, attacks, right? I think really our, our biggest takeaway was that you know um, there were so many moments that somebody could have raised that or, or or raised to the level of of the government or the highest level of of the police, for example, that there were very credible rumors that something was about to happen, rumors that had obviously reached the government itself. And so you know. I guess the, the 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 next level of probing is like why why wasn't it done right why why weren't the police better prepared why wasn't the government better prepared right? because it, it was clear that they were not prepared at all when it when it ended up unfolding the way it did. Next, I'm going to read out to you is um, half a comment, half a bit of a slightly rhetorical question. But in fairness to others that I have picked, I need to read this one out to you too. It says, Wu Mao, the five centers, have clearly invaded this conversation. <laughs> On that note, how much have they swayed Western opinion on mm. Hong Kong and sm smear the movement and us as rioters? You, would you like to respond to that? Yeah. Yeah. So, look, I mean, I think... Um, that unfortunately, you know, that is happening. That's part of, a, you know, a bigger kind of wholesale uh, movement that's taking place to kind of discredit and, and rewrite the history of, of the Hong Kong protests. We see it from the government, from organizations involved themselves. Remember, when we look back at statements from Carrie Lam's government around marches, um, you know, she thanked people for, for, for how peaceful they were, for coming out, for voicing their, their uh, opinions. Um, you know, people like the Hong Kong General Chamber of Commerce, uh, generally seen as very pro-Beijing, backed uh, an investigation into the police. All these things happen, right? These are facts. The, the statements are still out there. You know, as much as they want to forget us to forget or to erase them, those things took place, right? Only now do we see John Lee and Chris Tang change this, these black crowd, clad rioters to this independence movement, right? That was never the government's position before, and it's just shifted over time. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, that has sort of bolstered, I think, um, this narrative that has always been out there floating around about, you know, violence and, and rioters. Um, and, and I think just to, to, to take a step back, and you know, in the book and that we put together, um, you know, we are not, we're journalists, we're not, you know, advocates, uh, you know, in, in a sense uh, for, for, you know, for, for Hong Kong in a way that we'd be working for Human Rights Watch or something. You know, there's certainly... We do certainly have pieces in the book where we, you know, are critical of, of times of the moment where things became very ugly, um, you know, where things became very, very dangerous, where there was anti-mainland kind of xenophobic sentiment. Um, so I think, you know, we try to be, you know, even handed here. Um, you know, it's the government, I think, and these people online, 
uh, and various kind of voices that are recasting this uh, as this mass violent operation. But yeah, and just to add to the, the specific specific question about, you know, disinformation and so on, I, I do think it's been sort of effective within certain quarters, um, especially among sort of parts of the left in, in the United States and, and in, in kind of the, the broad quote unquote Western world, um, really have been very susceptible to narratives that uh, paint not just Hong Kong, but but Taiwan as, as sort of, you know, kind of like, uh, 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 like making the world less safe by like, you know, causing this militarization or, or this militarized response from China. And, you know, because they're so close to the US or whatever, um, sort of uh, 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 essentially being the ones who are driving this this kind of chaos and instability that, the that, you know, we're experiencing uh, geopolitically now, right, between the US and China. And, and um, I think, uh, you know, there's so much more work and investigation that should be done on how this disinformation and how these narratives are kind of seeping, especially among certain political sectors, you know, in in Western society, right? Because I think, yeah, I think it's 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 a it's a very very important topic to 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 kind of do more work on. In light of the time, I'll put the very last question that I can pick for you. Where do you see the future of Hong Kong now that? the Chinese government is rewriting Hong Kong's history and removing its colonial past? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's an interesting question. I think the government doesn't really want to remove its colonial past, right? They continue to use colonial laws to lock people up, um, and they continue to use sedition, they continue to use the public ordinance offenses, um, they you know, continue to have British police officers in their ranks. Um, so I think this narrative about decolonization um you know we've we've heard it from some people about you know changing the university system maybe changing the you know road names in hong kong you know this strikes me as is as, as terribly superficial um you know and and not really getting obviously at the roots uh of of the of, you know of what that issue is really about um in terms of the future um you know i think this year will bring probably more uh, national security focus uh, in Hong Kong. We know that Article 23 is going to be coming in. We know that there was huge protests in 2003, but will there be protests this time? I would very much say no. Um, you know, so I think that that's coming. I think that Article 23, because the national security law um, and sedition have been used, or the national security law has been used uh, kind of in one way, I think that, that Article 23 might be kind of focused at the media and, and in online discourse. We know that the government has been upset with 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 online platforms with Google with YouTube uh, with the glory to Hong Kong kerfuffle um, so I think we could see more controls of the internet um, yeah I mean I think that this year and then of course the Jimmy Lai trial is ongoing we're going to have the verdict in the in the 47 um, so yeah I think more focus on security above all else for Hong Kong I mean I think they've John Lee and, and his other people have made that very clear well thank you very much and many warm congratulations on your fantastic book. And I hope people who have participated who have not yet read your book would uh, read it. And apart from thanking you for the webinar, let me apologize to those who have raised questions that I have not been able to find time to squeeze them into the speakers. But let me reassure you again that we will be saving those questions and putting them to the uh, speakers after the event so they will know what comments or questions you have put to them. Um, yeah. With this, I conclude today's webinar. Thank you very much. And for next Monday, we will be back on to the regular 5 p.m. slot physically at SOWAST for our seminar. Thank you and goodbye.